The natural next thing, since we've talked about limits, is going to be how we can go through derivatives and then integrals of vector functions. And hopefully you can kind of guess already, it is just going to be taking derivatives and integrals component-wise. So we're going to start with going through our derivatives. So if we let r of t be our vector function, And then we define the derivative, then the derivative of R is defined by the following. So we still use our prime notation because it is still a single variable, R prime of T. If you think back to your formal definition of a derivative before, it did indeed involve a limit. It was the limit as h approach 0 of the function evaluated at t plus h minus the function evaluated at t all over h, okay. provided, of course, that this limit exists. So the only difference is here, when you go to subtract the two vectors, what you would do is subtract those two things component-wise. Dividing by h is like dividing by a scalar, so it divides component-wise. And then we know when we take a limit of a vector function, it's taking limits component-wise. So really, all you're going to do to take a derivative of a vector function is take the derivatives component-wise. So in general, if you have the vector function r of t, which has components x of t, y of t, and z of t, then the derivative of this vector function r prime of t is just x prime of t, y prime of t, z prime of t provided that those intermittent functions are differentiable. So we're not going to make you go through the formal definition of a derivative here. You do just get to use it component-wise. All of the same rules still apply, so again, refresh yourself on chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, all of those things. In terms of what the derivative represents here, is still kind of the same idea. Um, so we know that these vector functions trace out some kind of curve. So what that derivative does is it gives you a vector that's pointing in the direction of the tangent to that curve. So remember when we create a line here in two dimension or three dimension, um, you need the direction vector and that would exactly be this derivative. And then you need a point, which is just a point that's on the vector curve itself. So just to kind of give you a visual as to what's going on here so you can see it's still representing the same concept. We're gonna look at this in two dimension. So in R2, we have the following. So we've got our curve traced out here. I'm going to go ahead and move this over a tiny bit so I can write next to it. Now, I don't know what our curve looks like. Let's just say it does something like this. And let's say it's traced out in this orientation. So here is R of T. Okay. So if I have this initial point p here, then I've got the vector function, whatever value plugged in here, that gave me this as an endpoint. So this is our starting point, r of t. Now I'm adding a little bit to that input value, and it's giving me another point that is on this curve. So the vector that gives this as an endpoint 
is R of T plus H. Okay. Now, if you go ahead and take the difference in these two vectors, that's basically like using the triangle rule, but it's opposite. So you could, again, geographically show that this vector that connects the two would be the difference. So this is R of T plus H minus R of T. You can draw your parallelogram if you, oh, that's a terrible parallelogram. Let's do that again. You can draw your parallelogram in here. Okay. This would be the sum of those two. So this would end up being the difference of these two. Okay. So what's happening is you want to let the distance between these two shrink because it's just that value H that's in between them. So as you have a smaller and smaller value, this vector here will start getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And eventually what's going to happen is it's going to approach the tangent at this point. So you can draw the tangent line to this curve. We know how to do that. The tangent vector is the one that points in the same direction as the tangent line. So this here would be R prime of t. So if you have to create a tangent line, you use the derivative to get the uh, orientation of the vector, and then you use a point on the curve. And then you can go back to our section where we talked about creating an equation of a line with a vector function. So ultimately here, as this value of h approaches 0, the vector r of t plus h minus r of t and then divided by h because this is the quantity we're taking the limit of as h goes to zero this approaches the vector which lies on the tangent line at point P. Okay. So again, to show you, you can create, I'm going to use a smaller, you can create that tangent line as best as I can here. Let's see. There we go. This will be a little better. You can create that tangent line. And so you have a point on the tangent line. You have the direction vector, which is the derivative you can create the actual tangent line, okay? So we call this vector r prime of t. The tangent vector to the curve RT at the point P. Okay. The tangent line to the curve at P is the line through point P with direction vector R prime of T. So again, you already know how to do this. If you're looking for the tangent at a specific point, say when t equals zero, plug that into r of t. That gives you the point the tangent line passes through. Then you would plug t equals zero into the derivative vector, and that gives you the direction vector. So then you can create your equation of the line from that. Right? But in general, what we're going to be more concerned about is some other important vectors that result from this derivative. So we know we have a tangent vector,
but a lot of times what we actually like is our unit vectors. So we have just special names um, and notations for these. So there are ultimately going to be three important vectors that result as a uh, the result from taking this derivative. Realistically, only two are going to be the ones that pop up, but the third just kind of completes the set because it would create what we call three orthogonal vectors. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at a formal definition for our first important one. We're going to let R of t be a vector function. such that the derivative r prime of t exists and this derivative is not equal to the zero vector because I'm going to be dividing by r prime of t, something dealing with it, and the zero vector is what is going to pose some issues. So R of t is a vector function, the derivative exists, and the derivative is not the zero vector. Then the unit tangent vector is denoted by capital T of little t. This is defined by the following. The unit tangent vector is exactly the tangent vector divided by the length of this vector. Because remember, that's how we make it a unit vector. And this is why we want this to not be the zero vector, because I don't want the length to be zero, so I'm avoiding dividing by zero. Okay. So just to show you an example with this, Let's go ahead and find the unit tangent vector for the following function. So R of T is going to be T, T squared, t cubed. So we're going to find the unit tangent vector and we're going to use that to find t of 1. So first thing I need to do is I need to differentiate this vector and again I just do that component wise. So the derivative of t is 1. The derivative of t squared is 2t. And then finally, the derivative of t cubed is 3t squared. So again, what this does is if I want to find the tangent line corresponding to t equals 5, I would go ahead and plug 5 into here to get my point, and then I would plug 5 into here to get my direction vector. Okay. But now I'm specifically looking for the unit tangent vector, so that means I need to go ahead and find the magnitude of this thing. The magnitude is going to depend on where I'm at. So ultimately, I'm going to have a function for this length. So all we do is we take each component, square it, add it together, and then take a square root. So the length of this vector again is dependent upon t, that is 1 plus 4t squared plus 9t to the fourth. So in general, the unit tangent vector at any t value is going to be where we take the derivative and divide it by the length of the derivative vector. 
So I'm taking 1, 2t, and 3t squared. And I'm dividing that by the square root of 1 plus 4t squared plus 9t to the fourth. So you'd have to take each component and divide it by this radical. I'm not going to write that out component-wise because that would be a very long vector then. But this then tells me for any value of t what the unit tangent vector is, which again gives me the direction of my tangent line. So specifically, they ask us to use this to find t of 1. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to plug 1 in for all of these values of t. And then in the bottom, that would be 1 plus 4 times 1 squared plus 9 times 1 to the fourth, all under a square root. So ultimately, if you add up the bottom, that's 1 plus 4 plus 9. That gives you square root of 14. So each of these gets divided by the square root of 14. Okay. So again, just to show you, if you're asked to find the tangent line corresponding to t equals 1, this is the direction vector. And then the line, or the point that line would pass through, would be r of 1, which is 1, 1, 1. So you would use that point 1, 1, 1 with these corresponding slopes in each of those components to come up with the actual equation of the tangent line. Okay, So it just kind of combines a bunch of stuff that we've already learned into 1. So now that we're introducing this concept of a derivative, a lot of our same rules still apply. So you know how to take the derivatives component-wise, but what happens if I'm adding two vector functions? What happens if I have a function inside of a vector function? And then we have all these operations like our dot and cross product and scalar multiplication. How do I go about taking those derivatives? So you have technically a bunch of different ways you could do it. Like if I wanna take the derivative of the dot product of two vectors, well, I can find the dot product and then differentiate it. But I'll also show you another way you could go about that. So we have quite a few properties that we're going to go through. So we got to set up what each thing is. So let's suppose that u of t and v of t are differentiable vector functions. C is a scalar, so again, just a number. And f of t is a real valued function. You may also call this a scalar function because you'll input t and you're just going to get a real number in return, not a vector. So our first property is what if I want to take the derivative, and I remember this notation means take the derivative with respect to t, of the sum of these two vectors, u and v. Well, just like when you take the derivative of one function plus another, you can take the derivative separately and add it. Same thing here. This is equal to u prime of t plus v prime of t. If you have a scalar attached to your vector, just like when you have a scalar attached to x squared, the scalar stays out front. So all you do is apply that derivative to the vector function. If I want to take the derivative with respect to t of a scalar function, 
times a vector function. What this basically means is your vector function u, each component would be multiplied by whatever this expression is out in the front. But again, this is treated kind of like a scalar, but because it is the same variable here, we can take the derivative of this. So ultimately here, you can think of it, it's like the product of two functions. We're essentially just using the product rule. So if you remember that, you keep the first, differentiate the second. And then you do the exact opposite. Differentiate the first, keep the second. So to give you just kind of an example off to the side of what I mean by what this looks like, say you have t squared times the vector 4t uh, ln of t. Okay. I could apply a product rule. I would keep this, differentiate that, and then add the derivative of this times that. And in the end, I would still end up with a vector function. But realistically, what I can also do is just bring that t squared on the inside, simplify it, and then take a derivative component-wise. So completely up to you as to how you would go about that process. The next one, same kind of thing, but it has to deal with our operations of the dot product and the cross product of two vectors. So for the fourth one, if you go to take the derivative of the dot product of two vectors, it is again just the product rule and the operation stays the same. So you keep the first, differentiate the second, and you're still dot producting the two. And then you switch where you put that derivative. So u prime of t dot v of t. But again, you can find this first and then take the derivative. And the result, this would be a scalar function. This would be a scalar function. So the result is a scalar function. If you instead change this to the cross product, it's the same idea. The only difference is remember the order matters for the cross product, so you don't want to change this. It should always be uv, uv. So I need to keep these in the same order. And I'm going to just change where I put that derivative. So on this one, you could differentiate the first first. It doesn't matter, but the order states. Differentiate one, keep the other. The result in this case, this will be a vector function plus a vector function. It will be a vector function. Again, scalar function, scalar function. So the result is a scalar function. And then I just have one more property and it applies to the chain rule. Say you have the vector function u evaluated at the scalar function f of t. So using your chain rule, you go ahead and take the derivative of the outside. The inside stays put. The chain rule tells you you have to take the derivative of this. And so the result is a scalar function pops out. So we're going to put that out front. You would have f prime of t times this. So we're going to do or we're going to utilize these properties in a couple minutes um, just to show something nice that happens. But before I do that, now that we have these properties, I want to talk about these three specific vectors. But before I can talk about those three types of vectors, we have to introduce one more terminology. So because you can see with that unit tangent vector that we were dividing by um, the derivative or the magnitude of the derivative, that's a specific concept that we call smooth. 
So if you remember when you had a point where the derivative was equal to zero back in Calc 1 and Calc 2, that would correspond to some kind of critical number. Um, and it could be where the derivative is equal to zero, it could be where the derivative is undefined, but it often posed a lot of issues or it was very essential to us. Um, so in some cases, you get kind of like a kink in that graph at that particular point. We don't really like that to happen when we're at this stage. So this is a concept we have for vector functions called smooth. So we say a curve R of T is said to be smooth on an interval i if and only if the derivative is continuous on that interval i and the derivative is not equal to the zero vector on i. Because basically what happens is if you have the derivative is equaling the zero vector, it's going to cause basically like a sharp turn in your curve. And we don't want that. So if you think of like the absolute value function or some variation, that's that sharp turn. It's the same idea here. I want when I'm tracing this out, for my vectors to flow very nicely. I don't want a sharp sudden change. So I want it to be a smooth path if I'm walking along that graph in three dimension. Okay. So we need this for taking these derivatives um, for these three important vector functions. So we're gonna let R of T be a smooth vector function. Then our first important vector is the one we've already seen, the unit tangent vector. is t of t. It's defined by taking the derivative of this function and dividing it by the magnitude. So again, this will not pose issues because I'm not going to divide by zero. And then our next important vector is the principal unit normal vector. And that's given by n of t. You're going to go ahead and take the derivative of the unit tangent vector. You are not guaranteed that its derivative is going to be unit. So to make it unit, we go ahead and divide by the magnitude. Okay. And then the third vector is the binormal vector. This is given by B of T. And to find it, you're going to take the cross product of the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. So this binormal vector might seem a little bit strange. But like I said, it kind of completes this set in three dimensions. So one thing you can actually show is that these two vectors are going to be orthogonal to each other. So it would take a little bit of time, um, but their dot products you could show are equal to zero. And then just by definition, 
because you're taking the cross product of t and n, um, the binormal vector is going to be orthogonal to the unit tangent, and it's going to be orthogonal to the unit normal vector. So as a result, when you have this curve here, say r of t, these three vectors are basically going to create a new kind of system on top. So you have your unit tangent vector, which is going to point tangent to the curve. Then you have your unit normal vector, which is going to be orthogonal to the tangent. And it's actually always going to point inward for that concavity. So it points inward here. So this would be that unit normal vector. So as you're kind of moving along this curve, you've got your tangent here. In this case, it lies underneath. And then the unit vector points inside for that, or that normal vector points inside for the concavity. That's going to keep kind of switching back and forth. Um, what will happen is it's kind of like you can create another 3D coordinate system on that. You can get this binormal vector that's going to point offward. So it points in that third direction. It will form a right angle with these, a right angle with these, and then a right angle here as well. And then likewise, the binormal would look possibly like this in this instance. So this is a right angle, this is a right angle, and this is a right angle here. So it's like you're having your own coordinate system on the curve, which is kind of the benefit of having all three of these. Okay. Now, another nice property is you aren't always guaranteed that the unit tangent vector is going to be orthogonal to the curve. You know it's just going to touch, but it's very possible that for this particular point here, the vector that formed it came in like this. So you aren't guaranteed that the angle between R of T and the tangent is orthogonal. But if we have an extra property, that will be the case. So utilizing these definitions and utilizing our properties, we're going to show something that is going to pop up in the future for us. Okay, Because realistically, I think you'd be perfectly fine going through these. You'll have some homework questions that are on that. Um, but it's really just a matter of manipulating those vector functions and getting practice with your derivatives. But the actual creation of these vectors isn't super complicated. So even just to kind of show you back up here, you have this unit tangent vector. You can see the unit normal vector would be disgusting for this one because you would have to differentiate one over this two over this, three over this, that gives you t prime of t, and then you'd have to find the length of that thing to give you um, the unit normal vector. Then once you have that, you would cross product it with this expression that we have. So it can get very tedious. Um, just again, do your best. Your homework question shouldn't take you too, too long to go through, and it should simplify pretty nicely. Right? but it's a lot of just applications of stuff that we've already done. What I want to do instead is go through something that's going to be more useful down the road for us. So we're going to show if the length of our vector function is always constant, then when I take the derivative and dot product it with the vector function, it is always going to give me zero. So the consequence of this or what this is essentially saying is a vector function with constant length will be orthogonal to its tangent vector. Okay. Which again will be useful to us. 
So to just to give you an example of this, to kind of see why this is the case, if you think back to the vector function, r of t being cosine of t, sine of t. Okay. If you take the length of this, it's the square root of cosine squared plus the co uh, sine squared. That simplifies the square root of one. So the length of this vector is always one. And that makes sense because this traces out the unit circle. So this is our vector function r of t. Every single time you pick a t value, the length of this vector here is always going to be 1. What this example is saying then is because that happens, if I go to find the tangent vector at this point, it is going to be orthogonal to R of t. So the tangent vector here will form a right angle with R of t. And same thing here. When I find the tangent vector at this point, it's going to form a right angle with the endpoint of the vector that went out there. So any time the length of the vector is constant, you're going to immediately get this property. The way we're going to show that is using these properties of differentiation. So since we know that the length of this vector function r of t is c, we really can square both sides. And that tells us that this length is equal to c squared. But remember, when you're taking the length, it's really like taking the square root of the dot product. So squaring both sides is really the same thing as saying r of t dot product with r of t is a constant square. So if I differentiate both sides with respect to t, we get the following. So we need to differentiate the dot product of these two vector functions. And on the right hand side, I also need to differentiate the constant squared with respect to t. When I'm differentiating the dot product, that's exactly our product rule. So that's r prime or r of t dot product with r prime of t. And then we switch where we put that derivative. And on the right hand side, when you differentiate a constant, it is a big old zero. Now, realistically, though, remember the order doesn't matter for dot product. So these are going to be exactly the same thing because the result is just a number or in this case, a function involving t. So really, these are the same. So we can say 2 times the dot product is equal to 0. And then that 2 does exactly nothing. So this is exactly the result we wanted. Now, when you take the vector function r of t and dot product it with the derivative, it is always equal to 0. So you are guaranteed that the vector function will always be orthogonal to that tangent vector, okay? which is very, very, very nice for us. So we've spent a lot of time going over the derivative and all these properties of derivatives. So again, I'm skipping just going through examples of calculating the normal vector. We did one, however, with the tangent. So it's just a matter of taking a derivative and taking another magnitude. And then by normal, you're then just cross -producting, cross producting the two. What I would rather do is spend some time just going over some integrals because it may have been a while since you've had to go through some of these special cases. So we know that integrals also deal with finding a limit. So we could go through that formal definition if we wanted to, but realistically all that's gonna happen because it's a limit is 
it gets pushed in component wise. So we're going to take integrals component wise. So let's let R of T have the components X of T, Y of T, and Z of T, where these functions X, Y, and Z are integrable. Then the integral of a vector function is defined as you're going to integrate R of t with respect to the variable t. So really, you're just going to integrate each of these other functions with respect to t. And again, speaking about notation, it is super important that you are doing proper notation for your integrals. Your integrals always start with our integral symbol and you need to mention the variable you're integrating with respect to. We are very soon going to jump into double integrals and triple integrals. So you're gonna to have to integrate with respect to X, integrate with respect to Y, integrate with respect to Z. We're gonna talk about switching coordinate systems. So our DX, DY, DZ might switch to something completely different. You have to have these for things to make sense because the order is going to matter. So if you're not one that's writing the DT to close out the interval, you need to get in the habit as soon as possible. If you don't do it on your test, you're going to receive credit off for that. So it is very, very, very important to have that notation down, okay? And then the same thing with definite integrals, notation is important when you switch and make some kind of substitutions. Again, you've got to switch everything all at once. You can't have variables intertwine with each other. So when we define the definite integral, that just means we're finding the integral between two values. So if you want the integral from A to B of the vector function R of T, you're just going to integrate each of these over those same values. Okay. So if you can do a definite integral, you can do a normal integral. Just remember you put plus C at the end once you integrate. Here, because you're doing C in each component, you would put plus a C vector, okay? So let's try an example, and we're gonna do a definite integral. We're going to evaluate the integral from zero to one of four over one plus T squared times the vector j plus 2t over 1 plus t squared k. Okay. The other thing you're also noticing is I'm putting these brackets that are in here because that's part of my integral. I don't want to do this because it's like the limit operator, when you have addition inside of the limit, you have to write your limit of this thing. It's the same exact idea. I'm taking the integral of this thing. So I need some kind of parentheses or brackets around it. Okay. Now, if you notice here, I have J and K, I am missing the I component. So really what I'm doing is I have a zero in I. I'm gonna show you this with an indefinite integral so you can see how to go through that process. And then we'll go ahead and add um, those bounds back in from zero to one. 
So a lot of times you're also going to see me call an integral just i because we're going to have to do a lot of manipulation. So again, we're going to find this integral without bounds. We have nothing in the x component. 4 over 1 plus t squared in the y. And then 2t over 1 plus t squared in the z. And we're integrating with respect to t. So all that means is we're integrating component-wise. The integral of 0 dt. The integral of 4 over 1 plus t squared dt. And the integral of 2t over 1 plus t squared dt. Okay. So if you want, you can do each of these separately, and then you can come back to this integral. What I'm going to do is at least this one off to the side. This one's not so bad to just go right through. And then hopefully you recognize this one. It is one of our special integrals. So for the first, at least, you're looking for the antiderivative of 0. That's some constant. So I'm going to call that constant C1 because I'm going to have three constants. They do not have to be the same. Okay? Because the derivative of a constant is 0. Now here, as a little note, if you remember the integral of 1 over a squared plus x squared dx, that deals with your arctangent. It's 1 over a arctan of x over a plus c. So as an example, say you had a 9 there, it would be 1 over 3 arctangent of x over 3. Okay. Here, my value of a is 1. This is really like a 4 that's on the outside. So the antiderivative of this thing is going to be 4 arctangent of t. Okay. And then again, because it's this indefinite integral, we have to add a constant. But it is a different constant that goes in the second component. So we'll call it c2. Now this last one, we need to make a u sub for. So again, I don't like to mix it, and I don't want to put an integral here involving u when everything else is in terms of t. So I'm going to do this off to the side. We'll find the integral of 2t over 1 plus t squared. So it is a u sub. We let our u equal the denominator. 1 plus 2t, then du is 2, or sorry, I rewrote that wrong. It is 1 plus t squared. So the derivative is 2t dt. And that's exactly what I have in the numerator. So this is really 1 over u du. Antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And then going back, our u is 1 plus t squared. And then realistically, I don't even need these absolute values because 1 plus t squared I know is a positive quantity. However, you absolutely can leave them just to make sure everything is safe. So the antiderivative of this last one is the natural log of 1 plus t squared. And then again, plus a constant, so I add c3. Okay. Now this looks very, very, very messy. So really what we like to do is don't worry about the constants inside the integral itself. So if you go to integrate 0, it's 0. When you go to integrate 4 over 1 plus t squared, that is 4 arctangent of t. And then last but not least, when you integrate this expression, it's ln of 1 plus t squared. And then instead, I'm going to add the constant vector c1, c2, c3. Okay. So ultimately, you would get to skip this step and just jump immediately down to this. 
or really immediately what you can say is zero for arctan of t ln of one plus t squared and then you're adding a constant vector at the end. So again, at this point, you can ignore both of these and you would just jump immediately down. Integral of zero is zero, integral of four over one plus t squared is four arctangent of t. And then the last one is natural log of one plus t squared. And then because, because it was an indefinite integral, we go ahead and just add a constant vector. Okay. So that would be how you go about an indefinite integral. Now all I'm doing is I'm adding these bounds from 0 to 1, but that involves the antiderivative. So to show you all of this, now we can get our definite integral. If we integrate from 0 to 1, of 4 over 1 plus t squared j plus 2t over 1 plus t squared k. It's really taking the first antiderivative, evaluating it from 0 to 1, the second antiderivative evaluated from 0 to 1, and then the third antiderivative evaluated from 0 to 1. I don't like using another big bar right after I put an absolute value. You don't have to worry about the plus c because it was a definite integral. So here you have nothing involving t, so that just becomes 0. Here this would be 4 arctan of 1 minus 4 arctan of zero. And then I need a little bit more room, so I'm just going to move this over. This gives us natural log of one plus one minus natural log of one plus zero. So the first piece is zero. And then if you don't remember these, that's okay. Arctangent of one is pi over four. So this would be four times pi over four which gives you pi, and then arctangent of zero is zero. So the middle is just pi. And then this gives us natural log of two, and then natural log of one is zero. So the integral of this vector function is this resultant vector. So again, it gives you an idea of how to do both indefinite integrals and to do definite. Um, refresh on a lot of your old integral techniques and differentiation techniques because it is really just a bump up from that. So you want to be very, very confident in all of your basic derivatives and antiderivatives.